uh, uh, the presence of uh, Professor uh, Rosana Castiglioni from uh, Universidad Diego Portales in Chile. But before I uh, continue introducing her, I really do want to uh, have invite uh, Professor Christina Uwig from our Department of Political Science to actually make a more formal introduction of our guest. so much for the invitation. Uh, I, am, I, I hope I don't disappoint you because I'm going to take several risks. I'm going to talk about an area that is not the area I have published a lot. I am going to present something regarding student mobilization that has not finished. About a policy area that is being reformed, but it has not been reformed, fully reformed yet. And as we speak, Congress is fighting over budget. And so we don't know really if the budget will be approved to finance this reform. So what I was thinking when I accepted to make this uh, presentation, but I think it's very interesting, because we have the, the opportunity to test our models in something that is actually going on. So um, that's why I'm willing to, to take the risk. Um, so. Let's start. The, the question I'm going to try to answer is whether uh, protest has an impact, the impact on policy uh, reform. And I will say, my conclusion will be, that it has an impact on putting the topic of education reform in the agenda, but not necessarily in explaining whether a reform happens or not. That there are other factors, at the end I will talk about that, that explain that. So let me uh, put this uh, into context, Let's see if this allows me to do so. No. Should I work over here or over there? Yeah. Well, but I, can, I can start without the PowerPoint and, and, and then I put the slide. Um, the first part of my presentation is going to be centering in the legacies of the military role in Chile. 
And I think Chile is a very unusual country when you compare it to other Latin American countries that have military government. For one reason, in, 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 if you look at Uruguay, Argentina, Paraguay, Brazil, all of them have military government, but you don't have a structural reforms around social policy. Social policy was not part of the picture. And even economic policy was not that much part of the picture. In Chile, that was not the case. And from 1973 to, 19, to 1990, we had a process of orthodox economic reform. Social policy was um, seen as a sort of appendix of economic policy. It was subordinated so, to, to, to economic policy. And the idea was that social policy had to be removed from conflict. Social policy was a source of, source of conflict, a source of mobilization. So that had to come to an end. And that's why the military in Chile considered it crucial. Uh, and the other element also is the presence of an economic team of radical economists, the Chicago boys, that were willing to push for these reforms. So what you have in all social policies is an attempt to replace sort of universal, universalistic social policy by a set of market-oriented social policies. Yeah. Um, and by poli means tested policies. That's a very important aspect of it. Focalization, so that policies would be tailored to the needs of a specific subset of the population and not the entire country. Privatization, and behind was the idea that private providers were much more efficient than public providers of goods and of public goods and services. Municipalization, that was another key component, the idea that the central government or the state should not be in charge of social policy, of, of, of provision of goods and services, but smaller units, and I will explain why later. And uh, the general idea was to reduce the participation of the state. In elementary school, how, well, this happens in every social policy, so it, this is not related to education, this is related to the entire uh, social policy. In terms of elementary and high school education, the specific measures that were adopted and until now are in the country are curricular flexibility, municipalization, as I said, that is very important in education, and this is one of the keys behind mobilization of high school students. And the other component that is important, and I will come back to this later, are personal uh, per student subsidies. You, I don't know if you're familiar with the voucher system uh, of Milton Friedman. This was more or less the same that Milton Friedman proposed. The difference is that the uh, subsidies were not designed to uh, be transferred to the parents of the students, but to the school directly. So this is very important because it empowered a lot market providers of education, private providers of education. In terms of university education, there was an important law that was adopted in 1981, uh, the general law of universities, that basically brought free university to an end. So now it doesn't matter if it's public or private, you have to pay. That's uh, an important difference of what Chile had before. And uh, it allowed for the operation of new private universities. And that, that's new. And uh, throughout military rule, what you have is a reduction, uh, uh, a reduction of the budget allocated to public universities and to the university system. And state involvement at the university level also got reduced. And its main role, the main role of the Ministry of Education would be surveillance. So Ch Chile had, if you talk to Chile, I'm not Chilean, but if you talk to Chileans or to people who have been doing research in Chile for a long, long time, they will tell you about the teaching state, you know, this myth about uh, the role of uh, uh, you know, the government and the state in education. That came to an end, basically, with, uh, with military rule. The day before the military left office, they approved an organic law uh, la Ley Orgánica Constitucional de Educación, an organic law on education, 
that tied basically most of the things regarding the functioning of uni the university system up to now, up to these days. So, um, so this, this is what I wanted to underline regarding the, the background. Now, let me talk a little bit about how the um, educational system works nowadays in Chile. And you will see that it didn't change a lot. In terms of elementary and high schools, you have three types of institutions. Um, on the one hand, you have public institutions, and public institutions are now municipal institutions. Uh, before, the Ministry of Education was in charge of public schools. Now, that's, this is not the case. These are the municipal government. You may ask why, and why it makes a big difference. Well, I interviewed many of the uh, Chicago boys and Chicago girls that were working during military rule in Chile. And I always ask this question. Because, you know, in, in, the, in the view of some progressive uh, Latin American and Latin Americanists, decentralization is something good. You know, it's something very democratic. You transfer responsibilities to the community. So why would the military and the military government want to transfer responsibilities and, and, uh, to, the, to the municipal government? Mm -hmm. And I remember I interviewed this woman who was working in budget in healthcare, and she was the, I received the most clear answer from her. Um, I said, why do you transfer responsibility to the municipalities? And she said, well, you know, before we, we went through the process of municipalization, what we had was that whenever in education or whenever in healthcare, unions didn't like what the government was, was doing, you would have a big, a large union marching towards the Ministry of Education of Health. But when you have 350 municipalities and you transfer responsibilities to the municipal government, then you will have 350 small interest groups going to some place you don't even know where it is. So in a way, they saw municipalization as a key to break mobilization patterns and to break um, um, the powerful organizations that existed in the country. So let me, okay. Well, this was what I was uh, talking before. So uh, as I was saying, we have these three type of um, of schools in Chile, <laughs> okay, it's working now. Uh, first, we have the public public schools. I was talking that are owned and run by municipal governments. I will try to explain the context of uh, municipalization. Um, and for these uh, public schools, municipalization meant that uh, while local government would have jurisdiction over staff management at educational centers and the right to hire and dismiss teachers and administer educational facilities, the Ministry of Education would basically be responsible for surveillance and regulatory issues and uh, some pedagogical issues that are important. Uh, in terms of, um, of the private subsidies, these are the schools that rely on vouchers. That's the main, the, the key uh, element of financing this type of school. Uh, and as I was telling you, the voucher doesn't go to the parent, but it goes directly to the establishment that receives it. And the uh, third type of schools are what Chileans call particulares pagados. These are 7% of the students are enrolled in this type of schools, and these are tailored to basically uh, upper middle classes or uh, high income families. So um, in terms of universities, the system also underwent some important changes, as I was telling you before. Chile has now 59 universities. Around 20 uh, correspond to the traditional universities. Traditional universities may be private or public. Most of them are, are, are public. 
and uh, universities created after 82, after the reform of the military that allowed them to operate, are mostly private. Um, the Ministry of Education is, again, responsible for surveillance, and there is a National Council of Education that allows new careers to operate in the country, and there is a National Accreditation Commission that is responsible for the accreditation of universities. So it's important in, in terms of quality. But something that I didn't uh, talk about and is also important is that what the military didn't change was the non-for-profit nature of the university system. And this is also crucial. If for high, uh, for high school students, municipalization was a key of mobilization, I will talk about that later. For university students, the non-for-profit nature of universities is crucial. Uh, even if the law says that universities are not for profit, some of these newer universities, and some of the old too, have devised different ways to avoid complying with the law. And everyone knows this is true. How do they do it? There are two main ways universities can cheat the law. The first one is to have real estate companies. Real estate companies. Why? Let's imagine I own this university. You cannot pay me because I am the owner and this is illegal. So what I do, I create this, this, uh, this real estate company and you pay me rent. So I own all the land and I own all the buildings. And these are the owners of the universities. Of course, these universities don't have owners. The second way that public universities also use is to have, and this is the most debatable thing, whether it's wrong or not. I, I Actually, I don't think this is bad in itself. Some universities sell services. So you know, you open a consultant company, whatever, and that's the way you use to pay people who is conducting the research. But on the other hand, there are some public, for example, for I have been talking a lot with uh, deans or, or department chairs about this, and uh, scholars that are, for example, in engineering departments, for them it's crucial to have these, what they call incubadoras de negocios, uh, business incubators. And you need to have these uh, services, you know, payment for services going on. So that's complicated, but some universities use it in the good way and some others use it the bad way to pay the owners. But the real estate thing has been the, the most common way that these universities have uh, devised to, to get uh, the owners paid. And that's illegal. Uh, some, some, some numbers regarding results in the, in the higher education system. According to OECD data, 16% of total funding um, of the universities come from the state. So most of the funding for universities comes from tuition. The students are paying for the system. And that's part of why students are so bitter about it. I mean, uh, I think that that's important. Uh, the other thing that I, I think you have to take into consideration to understand this context is that the number of students in higher education has increased dramatically. Uh, there has been an explosion, and that's a good thing. I think that uh, the Concertación governments have done a great job in getting new students to the university. Um, but the problem is that from, if, you, if you consider that from 2003 to 2009, enrollment ha increased 54%. It's amazing. But if you take only the lowest quintile, the lowest income families, increase in this, only in this segment was 94%. So what we have is a massive um, incorporation of low income sectors to the university. And that's also pretty good. I think that's something, of course, we 70% of students in the higher education system in Chile are first generation. They are the first generation of the students in their family. They don't have 
parent or grandparent in the university. So that's the good part of it. Uh, but most of these students rely on loans to study. And these students come from very low income families. So there is when the complication to this is added. Um, on the other hand, I think that the universities have been tailored to educate. I don't have data on this. This is uh, just an opinion, but most uh, curriculum has been created to educate the sons and daughters of the elite. So then you have, then you have uh, the incorporation of students that don't belong to this elite that have come from very lousy schools with curricular flexibility, with only surveillance from the, from the authorities once in a while, and you get these students uh, into the university. So the challenge is how to uh, educate these students and how to get them graduate. And that's the other, other dramatic part. They uh, have very high chances not to finish their careers, at least four times more than sons and daughters of university level education people. So uh, this revolution has been quite painful uh, for, most, uh, for most of us, for most of us who are working in, in universities. 83% of those unable to finish his or her studies are first generation students. So what we are doing is to reproduce inequalities. Uh, we are trapped in this, in this system that gets most of these students in the university system, but is unable to retain them in the university system. Dropout is quite high. And then they end up with loans. They are unable to finish their careers, but they have to pay their loans. So this was like a, like a tam, time bomb. And I'm, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this. One of the very good things that President Lago did in Chile was to create this new um, this law, no? Ley de Financiamiento de Estudios Superiores, that would, basically what it means is that the state can be a guarantor for the loans of these students, including these first generation students, that require a loan to study. So this allows that now 70% of students are first generation. The problem is that they didn't think what, what to do after these students got to the university. So these same students realize they are unable to finish their career. And the other thing, well, the other measure that was important was the later retracto. If, uh, this is awful. This is just, I'm talking about this is a detail, but to picture how mis the misbehavior of some of these universities. When a student uh, applies for a university, then uh, a few days later they wanted to go to another university, they want to retract. These universi some universities would retain on their paperwork and their money, so they could not move to a second university. So there was a new legislation that forbid this, which is obvious that should happen, but it didn't. Um, I'm going to, you know, I, I don't want to talk a, that much about it. If you have questions, I, I, I'll talk about it later. I ran out of time already. Uh, this, is, this information I just wanted to, to, to show you. This is basically percentage of the students enrolled in the blue municipal schools. Uh, these other gray uh, lines here are private schools that receive public subsidies, the voucher schools. And this small line here, the white one, is uh, the private schools. This is 1990. After military, the military uh, came out of office and the conservation government came, you have something like 60% of municipal <coughs> schools, 
public schools, and then a little bit more than 30% particular, uh, particular subvencionado this with the voucher and the rest. Look at this. I mean, you, you could use this information to, see, to say that privatization in Chile was strengthened during this period because if you see municipal enrollment went down, 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 and I think it's 2008 that uh, the private subsidized surpassed enrollment in the system. And that's why uh, students claim that privatization has been increased during the concertación government related to this information. This is uh, university enrollment. I'm not taking technical uh, universities into account or technical institutions into account. The yellow are the new uh, universities, the non-traditional, the ones that were funded after 1982, and the gray are the traditional universities. And if you see the trends, it's the same. And that's why some presidents of universities and deans are so involved in the, in the system. Also. They, they, are, they are playing the same game. Anyway. This is total enrollment. So it has, this is not percentage. It's a real number. It has increased a lot. Um, what I would like to conclude in this first part of my presentation is that while education was a priority for uh, the, the concertación governments, and particularly for the Elwin and Frey administration, transformations introduced by this government uh, have not replaced the educational system inherited from military rule, and most measures further strengthen the main components of the system, decentralization, focalization, means testing, municipalization, privatization, so on and so forth. Known uh, political scientists uh, with knowledge of social policy in Latin America. Um, her first book, uh, The Politics of Social Policy Change um, in Chile and Uruguay Retrenchment versus Maintenance, was published in 2005 by Butler University Press. She's published in a variety of journals, both in the US uh, and Latin America, on social policy issues. Uh, Mostly on Chile, not so much in Uruguay more recently, but I always think of her as someone to go to when I want to know what is what is happening uh, in terms of social policy change in Chile. Uh, so her work in the past has been starting. I would like to start thanking so much for the invitation. Uh, I am. I, I hope I don't disappoint you because I'm going to take several risks. I'm going to talk about an area that is not the area I have published a lot. I am going to present something regarding student mobilization that has not finished. About a policy area that is being reformed, but it has not been reformed, fully reformed yet. And as we speak, Congress is fighting over budget. And so we don't know really if the budget will be approved to finance this reform. So what I was thinking when I... Primarily on health uh, reform, pension, Reform, and now she's moving and looking at education reform, which of course is something that all of us are interested in, especially based upon the, uh, the huge protests I think most of us are aware of that have gone on in Chile over the past year with regard to education. Um, and of course, she'll fill us in also. Those protests have been something that have been ongoing, not in just the last year, but they've really captured the international media attention in the last year. So with that, I'm going to let her Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. Let's see that I have all what I need before. Uh, 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 the presence of uh, Professor uh, Rosana Castiglioni from uh, Universidad Diego Portales in Chile. But, before I uh, continue introducing her, I really do want to uh, have invite uh, Professor Christina Uwick from our Department of Political Science to actually make a more formal introduction of our guest.